So having a temporal database like event store is like having Dr. Strange by your side. Okay. A big part of its power actually come from time traveling, manipulating time, and even creating multiple timelines. And this might sound a little mystical, but there are just some requirements that you will not be able to develop unless you have some kind of temporal database around. So for example, a bank might want to query accounts that receive 10 or more deposits over the past four years with a sum like this uh, for fraud detection. Online retailer might want to amend a long list of sales incorrectly entered three months ago, but they don't want to affect the sales report right now because it's already distributed to the board. Um, online password manager might want to block any attempt to, like a, if more than five were recorded in the past five minutes. National health records, electronic health records might want to predict how long a patient will stay in a particular hospital given his current symptom. So before I go deeper into temporal queries, let's take a step back and talk about the basics of a temporal database. So temporal database is a database that has some kind of concept of time, of course. Um, there are two sort of time um, in this kind of database. So there's valid time, which is the time when record is actually true. So for example, a hotel room is reserved for March the 1st. Maybe a patient was admitted to a clinic nine o'clock uh, March 30th. On the other hand, uh, we have transaction time, which is the time when the record is actually committed to the database, okay? So for example, we have the hotel room is reserved, like a reservation was actually made February 10th, notice this is a lot earlier than when they check in. And also um, patient admission was recorded on April 5th. So this actually was recorded um, after, much later, um, after the actual admission time, right? So these are the basic definitions that you need to know like uh, for, for the rest of uh, this part. So with this other way, I'm gonna give you, show you how temporal functions work. So there are many kinds of temporal queries, but we can give you a sense of what they are by categorizing some of the most common kinds. So I'm gonna sort it into four different categories. So there is um, state uh, with valid time, events with valid time, state with transaction, events with transaction. And this will make more sense when we go deeper um, into this. So the first one, so with state with valid time, we're trying to query the state at a particular point of time. So this is pretty straightforward. So let's go back to our uh, tracking example. A kind of query like a, that is similar to this would be like, okay, get me the location at time seven, say for example, okay? And the result of this would be J2. So on the other hand, um, say we want to get the location at T5, uh, we're going to get location H4, for example. Uh, so with these kinds of queries, we're getting the state at a particular point in time by adding up all the events from the past to just that time. Okay, so adding all these up. Um, and this is helpful to get a snapshot of what your state is in the past. So essentially this is time traveling, going back in time. Um, for example, like uh, sometimes in Git, right? It's useful to do like a Git reset to take a look at the code base in the past. Um, that's one of the examples that I can give like a, um, that is similar. So with these kinds of temporal query, um, so events with valid time, you're trying to extract the events or the history um, up to a certain time. So for example, if we're trying to get the location history uh, at T3, um, this is what we get. We just get, you know, just the list of locations from this. 
on the other hand, if we try to get um, the history for T5, we will get this. Okay. So this is the equivalent of getting like a log um, based on a certain point of time. And if we compare to Git, this is like doing a Git log um, for a certain, like a, for a certain commit. State with transaction time. So before we start, let's add transaction time to our tracker example just now. So um, right now, so I added transaction time. So right now the valid times and the transaction times are the same. So remember valid time is when these um, states are valid. So these directions are valid and transaction time is when it's recorded in the database, okay? So say one day you were told that there were some mistakes and some problems with the directions and they were mistakenly entered and should be like this instead. So how do we update this database? This is really complicated. We can choose to do so like by simply just changing the existing events. But the problem with this is that many other users may have already used this, the previous version. And if we did this, then the reports are gonna to get totally out of sync. The other problem is that we're essentially changing history here. And if audit trail is important, then this is not a good idea at all. Another more graceful way to tackle this will be to append um, another entry here that says that we are retroactively updating this record. And this way we're not updating or deleting any history. So in our example, we will say that, like say maybe there's a time future in the, in, in the, in the future, we are updating the directions So for time five, we're updating it to this. Time six, we're updating it to this. Time seven, we're updating it to this. And you can see like a, this is sort of like the newest version of the time. It's at version T100, okay? So we call this a retroactive update. And we are essentially rewriting history. Um, but at the same time, the old version is still kept and not destroyed. And this sort of updates are useful in real life when users may not be able to enter the correct values at the time of the update and may have to be retroactively updated at a later time. Um, it helps to give a lot of flexibility to your users, but of course it's quite complicated to explain. So let's see how this relate back to our temporal queries. So now that we essentially have two different timelines, um, say we want to find out what the final location is as of um, T100, our latest version. Then you would get a result I2 for this. On the other hand, what if we want the latest location as of time T7? You'd be like this. Again, like a, this is done. Um, by querying um, the transaction time and stopping like a, at T7 instead of going to T100, uh, which is going to tell like a, the logic that, okay, there are some new values in here, okay? So these kinds of like a transaction time query, it's very, very useful when there are retroactive actions and you want to check what the state was actually before someone messed with the past. And this actually is surprisingly useful for a lot of things like say financial reports, uh, sales reports. So people can make mistakes and sometimes like uh, maybe even forge uh, data with uh, bad intentions as well. And there have been times when like a sales manager would call me and ask me to explain why their sales forecast suddenly dropped like uh, overnight. And with this, you can actually go back in time and see like uh, where the problem actually happened. Um, and see if anybody messed, uh, messed with the data in the past. So the last kind of query is the event with transaction time. And this is very similar to what we had just now, but uh, we're retrieving a list of actions and events instead of uh, the final state. So say here, we want to get the history uh, for the new timeline. Um, it would give us something like this, which is a series of um, uh, different points. And if we wanted to get like a, the past timeline, then we can ask for um, 
you know, get get all the events for transaction time up to T7. And this will essentially give you like the past timeline instead. So let's summarize uh, what we learned uh, here. So a state-based valid time query gets uh, the state at a certain time. Event-based uh, time query gets the state history up to a certain time, okay? A state-based transaction time query gets you the latest date at a certain time, as of a certain time, sorry. And the event-based transaction time query gets the latest history of a state as of another certain time, okay? So these are the basic building blocks of temporal queries. And sometimes it's useful to filter both valid, um, valid and transaction time at the same time as well too, but um, it starts getting complex. So um, before we move on to other benefits of event store, let's make a few more notes um, about temporal functions. So today we've only been able to talk about temporal queries, but there are many other temporal functions that are useful as well too. So um, for example, you would have temporal aggregates, which is similar to like a group by query inside SQL, uh, where you can do aggregation of records over time. So you can do that, like say, oh, given like, um, um, given the history here, like how many like a, how many right turns did we do? How many left turns do we do? Like we have to like kind of aggregate all those things together. So that's kind of like an aggregation. Um, you have temporal updates uh, where you can actually undo, redo history, um, sometimes even create branches and merge history together. Um, I've done some of that in the past and it's kind of crazy. Uh, you have temporal constraints where you can block like a certain updates based on some temporal criteria. This is like a kind of like the example I gave just now, like a, with um, a password manager where, okay, if I try to log in like a more than five times within a minute, then block the user. So this is a kind of like a temporal constraint. Um, and finally, you have like a other temporal, like a data mining techniques where like, say you can use like a machine learning uh, to look for patterns in your data and do things like prediction and classifications. 